everyone. My name is Betty Sue Hertz. I'm the visual arts director here at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts and also the curator of the exhibition Downstairs, Dissident Futures. Um, usually when we have big exhibitions like this, we invite the artists, participating artists who are in town to um, come together to have a conversation with each other and with um, people from the audience. And so um, today, because we have eight artists with us, we have decided to break um, the session into two parts so that each artist um, has an opportunity to really talk. Um, and also, it, it gives us an opportunity to kind of have two, hopefully two somewhat <coughs> distinct conversations. So the, just the first conversation might take a different turn and have a different look and feel than the second conversation. Um, the exhibition itself is, um, was developed over a period of a couple of years, um, really as a way for us to start to think about how artists are engaging with questions around how we approach the future. And um, I've taken this tact of thinking about the future um, from three different perspectives, the pragmatist future, <coughs> the utopian future, and the speculative future. It was from these concepts that I developed the exhibition and invited 19 artists and artist groups to participate. Um, there's a range of artworks um, downstairs. If you haven't seen the exhibition or seen part of it, well, I'm sure you'll, you'll, you, you get a feel for how um, varied the work is. <coughs> Yet all of the artists in the exhibition are, are um, looking at an approach to the future from, sort of from the present. This is not an exhibition that um, is really prescribed about what that might be, nor is it an exhibition that looks at sort of the history of how artists have looked about at the future. In other words, we're not really going backwards. We're not looking historically at um, the 1950s and 1960s sort of as the way to start thinking about um, what might happen. Some of the artists are thinking um, in ways that might be aligned to in um, more utilitarian <laughs> notions of what the future might be um, um, about. Some people are documenting actual events that are happening. Um, but all of them are questioning, um, very much questioning, and bringing into um, the conversation doubt and anxiety about some decisions that are being made in certain quarters. And for us in particular, I was interested in um, the question, in, interested in, in creating a dialogue in the Bay Area with um, Silicon Valley Biotech, academic departments that focus on future theory, um, um, because I believe that they believe in some that they somehow have a hegemonic, um, um, you know, that, that, that what they're doing and what they're thinking about will actually drive um, many ways um, that we um, engage with the future in the, um, through their um, research and development labs at places like Google. Those labs are actually quite extensive. The people that are working in them have a lot of free reign to be quite creative, but the ultimate goal is to try to figure out sort of what is the next product, what is the next service that we can provide that's going to have a sort of very um, large profit margin. So um, there's a lot of people around this area um, in a very literal way within two blocks of here. There are about 200 different startup companies, at least 200 startup companies within two block radius of Yerba Buena Center for the Arts and um, also in the region as a whole. Now that also has the other <coughs> flip side of it, which is that the Northern California has long been associated with a, a kind of lifestyle adventurism, right? Um, it's often, you know, the first to adopt uh, liberal policies around uh, social engagement and lifestyle choices. Um, it's certainly the home of a kind of new age spirituality. It's, we have the legacy of, you know, the 60s and the flower children and all of this kind of thing. And I also think that that plays a very big role in, um, in how um, the area has been defined. I'm certainly not saying anything new. This is something that has been discussed and written about extensively. And this exhibition is in some way uh, in dialogue with all of that. So that's my quick introduction and the way that we're formatting these um, conversations, we will have four artists 
um, presenting in, um, in each of the two sections, and one of those artists has um, very generously uh, agreed to be not only a speaker, but also a moderator. So I'm going to be welcoming, um, and I'm not going to be doing long biographical introductions. You can find those online and on the back of this uh, flyer. If you haven't picked one up, um, we can hand them out to you. Susie is here to help with that. And um, you can read the brief bios. And mostly what we'll be doing initially is that artists will have a cha chance for a few minutes to introduce themselves and their work to you. And then they will engage in a conversation um, directed by one of them. So I'd like to invite Basim Magdi, Dan Mills, Colleen Smith, and Connie Samaras um, up to Dais. <laughs> and um, Connie is going to be moderating this panel. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> I think, did you all bring all the slides? Um, <laughs> did you all bring a, a PowerPoint presentation? No. Did you? Oh, Dan did. Yeah, did yeah. you call me? I didn't. So you just speak the only about your work or if you Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're, we were asked to introduce ourselves each for a couple minutes. And I'm Connie Samaras. And I, uh, the work in the show um, is of Antarctica, the South Pole, and Spaceport America. And those are uh, two series from a set of six series uh, that I started as a fin de siècle, a new millennium project, looking at uh, the uh, future imaginaries of global capital and how um, the future is held out uh, as a singular probability in these built environments. And my current work that I'm doing now, I'm doing a trilogy of works looking at uh, the series, the future is a series of possibilities, and I'm drawing from uh, the legacies of the social change, U.S. social change movements for that work. Anyway, that's briefly who I am. I'm Colleen, I'm Colleen Smith. I live in um, Chicago, and I. I Are you here? Just I live in Chicago right now, but, but I'm, uh, but I'm a native Californian, um, and um, <coughs> with the work that's in the show downstairs is. Um, inspired by some research that I spent a lot of time in Chicago doing around Sun Ra's early period. I think mean, a lot of people don't know that he sort of became Sun Ra and developed that whole persona, persona and cosmology in Chicago. And so I sort of went to that city to figure out what it was about that city that produced these crazy radical autodidact geniuses in music and in other uh, forms as well. From, I mean. Uh, in terms of like sort of black culture, uh, Chicago is this really kind of amazing place from, you know, from Kanye to President to Oprah. To, it's yeah. sort of like to Sun Ra. It's sort of like yeah. really amazing yeah. cosmology of black people that emerge from this city in particular. So I went to check that out and ended up living there, um, maybe hoping to uh, catch a little of whatever that is that's there. Um, <laughs> So the work downstairs are some uh, some videos and a discrete object. I it's, I call them devices, the projection into the things that you use to project video um, that were kind of not about not about a narrative around Sun Ra, but sort of about sort of using some of his tactics that he developed there to teach myself how to make things. Thanks. Sure. Sorry, that was small. No. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Dan Mills, and I've got uh, two bodies of work in the exhibition, of which uh, this is one of. One is from a uh, uh, essentially an atlas called the U.S. Future States Atlas. There's, I guess, six pages, if you will, from this body of work that uh, I created from early 2003 till the end of 2007. That started as a as a uh, kind of an, an exploration for me to investigate the, um, you know, frankly, the way our, our uh, uh, leader, government leaders at the time were negotiating or threatening to, go sh to negotiate uh, globally. And I thought, well, you know, if you push a few of these ideas a little further, you could justify, you know, invading or taking over just about anything. So I did, actually. 
and um, there are six pages that kind of represent 50 sure new states. Some are familiar. Um, mm -hmm. um, this is um, the last will be U.S. Arabia, <coughs> and as you know, we had kind of a significant investment in it. Um, but not, and if you go back one, uh, sorry, um, this is uh, U.S. Singapore, and uh, um, uh, put it up for two reasons. One is um, um, this imperial investigation led to a lot of different kinds of thoughts, such as, um, well, you know, if our economy isn't doing well, if we take over lands that have a much better GDP than us, then ours is better, right? So it, it's based on sort of a whole flawed sense of uh, decisions that string together and, and, you know, a few years ago seemed more believable than many people who read them care to exist, but it's a satire, okay? Um, so this is U.S. Singapore, and I invite you to read the bottom part in the show because I think it's apropos with the recent um, political activities and the decisions that were made um, with our economy recently. But you can do that on your own time. Uh, so um, this is a shot of uh, them all at, at the uh, Chicago Cultural Center with kind of documentation and, and uh, correspondence and other things that are part of it. And, it didn't look quite as brutal as it does there, but I sort of like that it had this almost brutality about the way they installed it and the, the light. Um, so this project is literally, you got about 10,000 words figuring out as I went along this grand narrative. The second body of work is ongoing. Um, that's more of them, but the, the next uh, image, these kind of take the opposite strategy, which is I painted out every word um, um, and uh, on maps, uh, the information that basically uh, tells us what a place is, but is an indication of history and other things, and thinking more abstractly about um, the notion of uh, you know, colonialism and imperialism as a form of erasing and erasure. Um, and they're also thinking about painting, too. So. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Bassem Magdi. Um, I live between Basel, Switzerland, and Cairo in Egypt. And uh, I have three works in the show. Uh, one is called Investigating the Color Spectrum of a Post-Apocalyptic Future Landscape, uh, which is a, a series of 80 slides. Um, they were shot in um, an island in Spain, in the Canaries, uh, Lanzarote, which is very arid and has a, it's volcanic, so it's basically just volcanoes and lava and water. Um, the reason I, I thought this was interesting because to me this is one of the most post-apocalyptic landscapes on Earth, and um, I decided to do this in a using a process that I've been developing for the last two years, which is I call it uh, film pickling. It's something that's been done before. I haven't invented it. A lot of people have tried to. Um, it <coughs> manipulate the image that they can get out of film using chemicals directly uh, on the film. Uh, but basically what I do is that I put, I put the film in jars full of household chemicals uh, for periods of time and then there's a, a more elaborate process uh, that happens in a dark room. And eventually what I get is that each, each kind of film stock using the same one specific chemical would produce a different uh, dominant color and a degree of loss of detail. Uh, so by using a lot of different film stocks and a lot of different chemicals um, separately or one after the other, the effects and the outcome is, is really, the possibilities are infinite. So I, I use this process with those um, images to try to create this, this um, kind of archive or documentation of a place that will exist in the future. It's kind of like a, a record of something that is in the future. Um, and uh, another work of mine in the show is called The Future of Your Head, which is the big uh, mirror piece at the entrance with the text that says uh, your head is a spare part in our factory of perfection. Um, the idea for this is pretty simple. You look in the mirror, you read the text about your head, and you see your head. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it also, because the, the text is very, um, it could be applied to a lot of things. People have uh, 
said that they thought it was coming from science fiction or from, I don't know, uh, Nazi literature. It goes like the spectrum of things that I've heard is, but the thing is I, I just, um, it started as a sentence I wrote in one of my drawings and uh, I thought I wanted to take it a step further and I thought of how to do this and I ended up uh, using it in, in this piece. And then I have a, a group of works, what I call works on paper because they're not really drawings and they're not paintings, they're kind of, you know, they have spray paint and collage and acrylic and so, yeah, and those are, it's not, it's not a, 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 a set of pieces that I always show together, this is something that always changes. I, I do the groupings depending on a lot of things, so I chose those for, for this particular mm -hmm. show. Well, um, what I was telling everybody is that I have a few questions to ask each artist. And um, what I'll do is I'll talk about a little bit about my own work and the context. The questions I ask you, since, you know, or you can ask me later. But I, but you feel free to ignore the questions and just carry on and talk about whatever you want, <laughs> like, you know, like a, a politician, right? <laughs> like we were talking about earlier. And then, of course, uh, I want to leave time for you all to ask these questions and to engage. But one of my particular interests in my work is science fiction and, and speculative imaginary. So that will be the sort of frame of my questions to each of you. Because, uh, uh, well, I'm going to start with you, Colleen. Okay. I have my little notes here. Uh, I, uh, I was wondering if you could talk more in depth about Afrofuturism mm -hmm. because it's a really complex idea, and um, I, I don't. Uh, and uh, certainly, there's other artists in the show working with it, and your people are working in different ways. And um, so, I was wondering if you could talk about how you define the term of it, mm -hmm. and um, and how your approach to it, because it's both a literary and a creative aesthetic term, like it draws from people like Octavia Butler, right. Samuel Delaney, right. like science fiction and the whole, right. and then Sun Ra, right. Funkadelic, right. and uh, uh, George Clinton, which I have to say years ago when I lived outside of Detroit, I saw Sun Ra, uh -huh. and Parliament Funkadelic, and uh, Clinton. Not all at once. Uh, just very close <laughs> together, yeah, and it's like a seer, and every time the word concert comes to my brain, I see nothing think. else. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, and, uh, so I think there's a, a, a lot to talk about there, and but one of the things uh, I wanted to bring up is one of my current interests is looking at this idea of what's called a, the archi archival turn in feminism, where you're looking at an mm -hmm. archive, mm -hmm. and that you're not just simply using it to recreate the past, although well, that's not a bad project. Right. But it's to take it and to start to build, to collapse generations, right. and to build political alliances and strategies. I love and, that that yeah. term to collapse generations because yeah. I actually think that's a lot of what Afrofuturism. The term is a clunky, awkward term that generates a lot of reactions, but really it's just a name for um, certain cultural producers who were really interested in moving through space and time in a sort of really literal way mm -hmm. through culture. And so like having direct conversations with like George Schuyler who wrote the science fiction scathing satires in the 30s yes. to, uh, um, you know, to sort of like um, hip hop artists like Dr. Octagon here based here in the Bay Area and sort of like trying to collapse it and make, and, like find this way of, of um, recuperating and re recontextualizing certain histories so that they didn't they weren't they didn't remain sort of marginal they became like essential texts and, and I think after the term came up uh, really you know it was Mark Derry Greg Tate Trisha Stone these are some cultural writers in the late 80s Mark Derry c coined the term he he centered his conversation around Sun Ra George Clinton and Lee Scratch Perry three musicians who invoked the cosmos to define not only their music, but their, their personas, who they were, um, and um, sort of spoke <coughs> about the way in which uh, this is a completely logical strategy for African Americans or Africans in the diaspora, given our history. I mean, there's like, it's almost too easy, the narrative of um, being sort of like kidnapped, put on a ship, and journeying like for like a great distance and landing somewhere at basically a new planet and having to figure out what it is, learn. you don't know the language, you don't know where you are, you don't have a language, you don't even 
have like a personhood yet, and so like the 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 the, the sort of like the actual like long memory and long history of African Americans works so well when you think about let's say if we go to Mars and you know the the group of people on that ship today five generations later their children will land on Mars and they may not even have any idea what they're doing there mm -hmm. and that's like a that's like a willing sort of journey but the, mm -hmm. the the idea of distance and time and what is lost is sort of kind of what Afrofuturists seek to play with mm -hmm. um, I, and you know what I say all that and I can think of ten people who have something else to say about it that's but that's just one way of talking about it yeah. you know what I mean it's, it's a really loose term it's a really open club anybody can join <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting, you're bringing up the whole obsession now with um, the deep space travel that has this, there's a renewed interest in it, obviously. And there's also, as Betty Sue's talking about, this is, I'm based in Los Angeles and here in Southern California, there's all these space industries developing. And that's, Spaceport America is the first commercial space hub. Mm -hmm. That's really, uh, there's the tourism thing that people are all hot about, but it's really going to be for, these <coughs> industries are really, made around linings and uh, space mining and satellite launching. But it's interesting to think about this, the imaginary of space. Mm -hmm. And because our bodies can't Our bodies survive. won't be there. So yeah, we're going to be leaving things yeah. as information, as directives. Yeah, and you and always that can be such a distortion. Can you imagine? Yes. Whoa. Yeah. Scary. And anyway. I always think about, like, you always want to say, like, why is all this money being spent on this untenable idea without really with discursively with addressing what happens to us, right. our bodies in space, mm -hmm. not to mention everything else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I always I loved Octavia Butler when she talks about this idea of thinking about space, how important it is mm -hmm. to the human imagination, mm -hmm. but how wrong it is not to think of it without thinking about change. Mm -hmm. so, um, oh, that's wonderful. That's can you talk a little bit more about your, your pieces in the show? Do you want to talk a little bit more? Okay. Um, so there's one installation that's beautifully installed, by the way. Thank you, Betty Sue. Thank you, <laughs> your Um It's uh, the Ark After the Flood, which is um, a fish tank, basically, with a video projector shooting a video through it in order to make a rainbow. And that's the actual, the objective of the device is to make this rainbow and to play a video, to do those things. That's all it is, and uh, <laughs> I mean that's not much of anything. <laughs> that's and, uh, there's like a lot of geeky stuff involved, in, like uh, finding this recording of Sun Ra playing over the rainbow, and then finding a recording of him talking about the movie The Wizard of Oz, which apparently he was obsessed with, wow. and then learning that um, huh. a lot of j uh, solo pianists take on that song. Like it's a standard, it's a jazz standard, like a lesser known. To, to prove, like, the, like to sort of prove ideas about interpretation. So I found as many as I could, and those are all, there's like four different artists playing their renditions, two versions by Sun Ra, one by Art Tatum, one by Mary Lou Williams, one by Keith Jarrett. Um, and so that's again about that collapsing, right? Because they're all from different atoms. Tatum's the 30s, Mary Lou Williams is the 50s, Keith Jarrett is contemporary, Sun Ra is like, like 50s to 80s, you know? So it's all about this conversation that musicians have routinely through time just through a simple pop tune you know mm -hmm. there's a lot going on in there but that it's just a device to play these songs play this video and make a rainbow that's what i think about <laughs> <laughs> yeah <That's funny. laughs> um okay dan you're the next victim yeah. oh. <laughs> so, um, um and again feel free to just go on however you want and ignore these but what I find interesting about cartography is how speculative it is. I mean, just the practice of, it, uh, of itself, for example. I saw a lecture a while back on a, 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 it was a conference on Antarctica, and there, as you know, they, anyway. but this one um, uh, uh, historian of maps was talking about the history of the maps of the world. And dating back hundreds and hundreds of years before, long before Antarctica even got discovered, so-called, you know, it's, who's doing these discovering, because right. of course it's a Pacific Islanders. But what struck me is like these maps from uh, as long as uh, the logo as the Middle Ages would show the landmass, you know, that wasn't just the end of the world, but there was some sort of, sometimes it would show a landmass. And um, uh, so I think it's an interesting question with the speculative could become predictive in some ways. But, mm -hmm. but uh, then the, I know that your, your work deals a lot with imperialism and colonization. And I just want to say that 
when I was in the South Pole, the thing I loved about the place itself is that the U.S. Can only, is the only place that can feel, afford to build stations there. Every, and every 30 years, the ice covers whatever they build. Okay. Covers it over completely. <coughs> and it also can shift off of the geological South Pole. So wow. it's, uh, it's uh, indifferent to colonization. It's a, it's a mm -hmm. cool place. But, um, but anyway, I, I, I'm, it, I'm interested in hearing, you know, uh, it's more about your work, but also it's interesting to me that you're, uh, uh, how you're thinking about using analog uh -huh. devices uh -huh. in yeah, a yeah. digital age mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. um, we're all looking at Google Earth and things like that. Which I'm absolutely looking at yeah. and using any, any tools or means available to gather information, to learn, to look at. But I, but I choose to then, at least with this work, um, do that that sort of old school studio practice of how I how I realize them, and I'm I'm sort of unabashedly an object maker. I do. Oh, yeah. I love the practice and I love the outcomes, but it, but I use anything and everything to gather the information to do it. And uh, let's see, the U.S. Antarctica, which is the I think the 47th state in the group and it's not here but, uh, and, and I knew at the time and I wrote in um, what I remember about uh, Antarctica is that I think and you may know this, this I think there are 16 or 18 countries that have claims do you, do you and but there are two that have the biggest claims and that's us and Russia some say that's why they're we're at the South Pole because then you're on every yes and as I recall, um, we're, we're the only ones that ha that somehow have the authority to claim more, whereas the others do not. And I, I just it's fascinating. Um, and I think I learned that from the maybe the CIA World Factbook, um, which is a really wow. fascinating source online. Um, if any of you are, you know, considering your own you know, imperial investigations or what have you. You can find out uh, population size, but also how many AM radio stations and small gauge railroad tracks and what the uh, literacy rate is and the AIDS rate and the GDP and, you know, you name it, uh, which was really sort of a fascinating discovery at, at one point. Um, so, but yeah, the, the you know, back much earlier in my work, I became fascinated with maps and cartography simply because initially just because they're it's they're so beautiful but then the next step is there's this beauty but then and, and I and I love the fact that this abstract language is something that is maybe not universal but it, we 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 are able to look at uh, this kind of you know data presented this way and, and project into it and understand things that are highly abstract but then the next step is it's highly understandable because of everything that's omitted, right? I mean, it, it's a way of focusing on very specific and, and uh, very limited um, kind of knowledge and information sets to, to make something un as you know, big as the Earth or the cosmos understandable on a piece of paper this size. And who makes those decisions and for what purpose and who commissioned it are, you know, so each, each thinking and looking deeper brings a different set of questions that to me are really <coughs> fascinating mm -hmm. and yet they're still beautiful you know so um. yeah well, I think it's interesting about the analog use in your work with an mm -hmm. object is that it becomes a hard copy can become a way to scrutinize uh -huh. it's like uh -huh. ever shifting yeah um, terrain and present and especially that like, you know given the virtual space well, you know, the um, when I was making it, I I, um, I kind of uh, I sort of went down a rabbit hole, and I didn't realize this was going to be a multi-year project, and and kind of didn't show too much, and became completely consumed with having the the narrative, the order that parcels of land were acquisition, and all that be believable. I uh, realized at some point after making a few and realizing, wait, I'm, this is, well, I think I know where this is leading, but to make it believable, I had to um, essentially find a way to conceptually embrace so I could understand the very thing that was the reason I was making it, which was 
as a form of critique, which is a really strange thing. Um, but I had a few chances to show parts of them in progress, and the way I showed them was uh, I would only show them if the institution could get some flat files for me, hmm. and would put them in flat files and put you know put Plexi on them so they'd be safe, and then just leave leave them a little ajar hmm. so that if you came across them, you might wish to open and, and have access to this inf information and not have it particularly explained. You know, and I was still trying to figure out how I was going to, you know, what form it was going to take. Um, but anyway, so that reminds me of the, you know, I mean, I really liked that. I mean, that's even more kind of an old-fashioned way of like, going to the library and okay. looking at cards. It's like, you know, to pull out these, and they're presented with that sort of authority that old school authority of you know archives have important information and important documents and historic and I, and I like all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting question about what's happening to the material in the digital world. But, uh, I like to work on film cameras, and recently I went to buy a medium format film camera to replace an old camera body, and I went to Phoenix Photo in New York, and I thought. I said, what is it? Like, I'm paying the same use price that I paid 20 years right. ago for this camera. So what's going on? Because they were giving them away, you know, like five years ago. He says, oh, all the younger people are buying film cameras now. <laughs> you know? And there's a, there's a very famous, there's a very well-known, perhaps you know it by uh, Neil Stevenson called The Diamond Age. It's a sci-fi novel. And it's about, yeah, and it's about <laughs> nanotechnologists rule the world, right? And, but the thing is, um, they themselves um, only live in a, a place where everything's handmade, their houses, their clothes. <coughs> and, uh, mm. yeah, so so uh, it, I think these are really interesting questions. Do you, have you made books of these? I'm just curious if you um, work with a book form. You know, um, I kind the, of long to sit down and just like, there, go through them in a scholarly a, way. Well, something. there was a press that made a, uh, made a book of them, uh, Percival Press. Um, and I'm um, oh. happy to say they, they uh, once they agreed to do it, they gave me pretty much free reign on things. So it has a faux leather cover with gold embossed, mm -hmm. the map on the front, and all those things that I, that I love that are those sort of symbols of authority in the, Imperial the old. Britannica. Yeah, so it has that. Uh, <laughs> so they printed it. And the only thing, I think it's a you know, U.S. Future States Atlas by Dan Bell's American edition. I think it's mm -hmm. embossed on the front. That's so. great. Uh, so it exists in that form, and they're large enough to be readable. And conceptually, I like it because it keeps all of them together. Is it a and small edition? Um, yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks. So, um, Sam, I was reading on your wall label that you, you're a longtime fan of science fiction. A kid, right? Yeah. And uh, by the way, I was saying to Betty Sue, God, those wall labels are really good. It's like, sometimes they're not. <laughs> they were really good, they were informative. I actually felt, you know, they really related to everybody's work. <laughs> and again, science fiction is something I'm very interested in working with, and it's, a, it's an ever-shifting genre, that's the thing. It's a genre that always reinvents itself, and I think that people tend to think about it in a kind of uh, uh, very, uh, can't think of the word, but just uh, a singular way, right, in terms of what's going on in mainstream. And uh, one of my interests in it is like I think science fiction in, in the United States is to the is a literary genre to the United States what magic realism is to part, parts of Latin America. It really drives how this country dreams. It's you know, in a, not in its high monolithic sense, <laughs> yeah. how it pictures itself, and dreams itself, <coughs> and. Um, and there's been um, a lot of really recent interesting work, because a lot of the, the writing and theorizing is often about American and, and British science fiction. But there's a lot of work being done now on transnational science fiction and how that differs, because cosmologies differ in different cultures. So um, one of my questions to you is uh, um, how, what, what do you draw from when you talk about that you see these as near dystopic futures, and you know, and the and again, uh, like Dan, you're using the analog, using uh, chemical, uh, not only chemical photography, manipulating it, but also the, the slide projector, which connotes uh, 
a, a different kind of point in technology. And so I'm just wondering, and, and then the images themselves, um, of the, I mean, I know they're of the Canary Islands, but they, they, they do sort of also, they also quote the sort of Western landscapes you'll see in Star Trek films, or any that sort of atmospheric set of the landscape in science fiction films, mm -hmm. and which uh, is a kind of movement in my mind from uh, colonialism to the idea of the U.S. Western expansion going into the, you know that's used quite a bit to the rhetoric is goes from colonialism ex, you know Western expansion to space exploration so they become kind of collapsed. Mm -hmm. I, I, think, I don't know if any of these resonate, but I'm interested to see. I think the most interesting thing about science fiction for me is that it never happens. It never becomes real. We never arrive to that point yeah. where fiction becomes our reality. Um, in, a lot of <clears throat> in a lot of science fiction books, when the future is being mentioned by date, um, let's say the older science fiction, we've already reached a lot of those dates, and none of what's in those books has happened. Um, a lot of, let's say, promises were made by, you know, the people who wrote those books, or I wouldn't call them promises, they're, you know, they imagined the future to be something. And I think, well, I mean, I was, I was probably quite young, maybe 14, when I, I became really obsessed with this idea that, um, of how progress is very linear. Every event, one event leads to another, and one, one, detail of what we call progress leads to another and then we end up taking a path and then there is always the possibility that at any one of those points we could have taken another path starting from this point from this detail this applies to science to history to <coughs> what we call progress or civilization and a lot of what I do is trying to imagine how that would have been like today so if we had decided to, let's, for example, to not stop film and go ahead with video or digital uh, media, what would film um, have been like today if, you know, well, I mean, because the process of stopping producing film started a while back, so there's, there was no um, kind of development of film. But what we, if what if we had decided to keep on producing film and making it better and looking for other um, possibilities for it and not adopt digital video as you know the new form that everybody should be using um, so that's that's what I I mean that's that's one of the reasons why I decided to work with film I started working with film um, I started working with Super 8 film actually I wasn't really interested in photography um, and I moved to Switzerland, I went to a second-hand store, I found a Super 8 camera, it was interesting, I thought I'd try it, so that's how I started. Uh, it wasn't uh, nostalgic to me or anything, it was just something completely new. Um, and then at some point, because of my the, the interest I developed in film, I um, started reading a lot about film, and uh, at some point I read online about someone who had put a roll of film in the dishwasher, and then they posted images of that, and it was really beautiful. So I thought I'd do the same. I went and I bought a roll of film and I put it in the dishwasher. Of course, the images were horrible. <laughs> but uh, that's when I realized that um, the effect of, you know, what you do on different film stocks. So I started working with different film stocks, and uh, um, and that's how I reached that point. And the reason why I do this is because I want to see the possibilities, had we kept on going in that direction, what possibilities are out there? Um, this, the, the effects I get from, from manipulating film with chemicals is something that I would never be able to get digitally. Um, it's it's um, because there's also a lot of, I mean, it's informed decisions that I make, but there's also a good amount of chance. Uh, but at the same time, it's just not something that has been because Whatever we do digitally is something that is uh, calculated whether in, in software and the people who build the software or um, in, in the way the camera is designed to film. But these things are not 
things that people think of when they design because these are um, there would be malfunctions. Um, the reason I went to this particular place is because I didn't want to make work about the medium, about what the medium can do. I like, I wanted to present this in a, to put it within a context that makes sense with the effect itself. Um, so I actually happened to be there on holiday with my family, but when I did research, I realized that it looks a lot like Mars, or it's, it's a, uh, it's very arid, and um, I, I didn't really make the connection with um, Star Trek. And I actually recently I was looking at uh, I think uh, uh, pictures that uh, photographs that an artist had taken at uh, I think it was a Star Trek um, set in Tunisia. So they actually go to arid places. I'm not sure why they chose to go to those places. Maybe it's because it was exotic or different from what the public will watch the film is familiar with. Um, well, I think that's one of the things I was, that's one of the things, points I was making about this idea of colonialism, that the imaginary in uh, mainstream science fiction is the U.S. Western expansion into the you know, Western <coughs> plains and deserts. And that, you know, that then informs an aesthetic of how deep space is pictured. Or our planet's not deep space itself. Yeah. But I'm curious though, um, how does this tie back to, <coughs> so what are your thoughts then about when you talk about this work in terms of a, uh, a dystopic, post-apocalyptic, post-apocalyptic landscapes? Well, I mean, that is another possibility. Everybody's always talking about, you know, um, an apocalypse. There, there's, you know, in the past, I, I don't know, as far as I remember, 20 years, let's say, there have been several instances where people were talking about uh, an apocalypse and something that would wipe out humanity and what would the world be like. I mean, chicken pox, uh, um, um, I don't even no, not chicken pox. Um, smallpox. Smallpox, sorry. <laughs> chicken pox could that, do that, it. That sure didn't sound right. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, it, a lot of diseases, uh, mad cow disease, um, bird flu. Yeah, yeah whatever. A lot yeah. of a lot but, of things, but yeah. also at some point there was a, a I think a, a, a some I think it was a, a large meteorite that was coming too close. There's always a reason for us to be scared, and it's just it was interesting for me to take a step forward and try to imagine what this place would be like without us, but also to come back with the record of what that's like. And the reason, another reason why I decided to shoot it on slides because I wanted to have a tangible record. I wanted to have this actual slide that I could touch and not just in a digital file that, you know, exists on a computer. Yeah, like when you lose your hard drives. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted it to be something you can, you can yeah. touch. And then, yeah, somehow the, the, the slide presentation thing has, uh, you know, educational kind of um, influences, of course. Um, or, yeah, I mean, for a long time people were doing this on slide projectors. And because it was shot on slides, it made more sense to show it as a slide. I was thinking what you were saying about uh, putting the, the film in the oven. One of my favorite experimental filmmakers is... Uh, Carolee Schneeman, and you know her film Fuses. I don't know if you know that film. No. She, uh, th it's made up of 30 second, uh, she's shown it on a Bolex, but 30 second segments of her and her boyfriend at the time having this like great sex and the cat's watching. And, but she often <laughs> uh, draw, at the time she was drawing on the film and, and one of the things she did, she put the film, hung the film out during lightning storms. <laughs> I'm hoping it would get hit by lightning. It's it's really brilliant. Did it get hit by lightning? I don't know. Or I can't remember. It would be interesting to see what that did to it. She was hoping, right? <laughs> you would just be like, psh. Yeah. It yeah. would burn. Flashed. <laughs> that's yeah. right. That's right. Light flashed. Yeah. Anymore. Non-existent anymore. Yeah. Well, let's see. Um, it's 2.52. <clears throat> I know this. we have the next batch in about a few minutes, so maybe we should turn it over to the audience or each other, or, or I could just babble on. SpaceX, Detroit SpaceX.
you guys have anything? Yeah, sure. Um, can you guys talk a little bit about what you're working on now? Sure. Your yeah. Working on now. I'm trying to stop working on Sun Ra things. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. It's been difficult. It's yeah. like, uh, I don't know. Find a lot of your artists, so you can relate to like you finally make something people like, and then you're tired of it. And um, don't I like uh, I need to just stop doing this kind of work for a minute and move on to a new, probably a new research <coughs> project. Because um, we didn't get to talk about the archive, but mm -hmm. I I really love I like what comes out of researching and like using archives as just a material without a, a whole lot of sort of preciousness or obligation towards a sort of historical veracity, maybe a more empathic way of dealing with these objects or things or papers or images. Um, and so uh, there's a, another sort of crazy character from the 20th century that I'm looking at right now. Let's start something. Um, <laughs> I was thinking about the center on your piece next to Wasim's piece, and so the audio bleed is kind of great. Do you, because it <laughs> reinscribes yeah. your work from like uh, just the, the you know, when I look at it and seeing these Western landscapes used to uh, set the texture of sci-fi films, I hear this music and it's like, oh, you know, it, it changes it completely. There's so actually a very real really Sun Ra Egypt connection. Did yeah, you know yeah, that? Yeah. Yeah, 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 right, exactly. I mean, his name is Ra. <laughs> <laughs> well, That's yeah. Egyptian. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there is that, but I was actually, like, actually not just his name, but he actually, um, um, uh, partnered with the uh, like the minister of music of Egypt post the revolution, yeah. and the military army um, was headed by a man who loved American free jazz. And when mm. Sun Ra was touring, they connected and they actually like collaborated um, pieces. And he recorded an album of free jazz with his military uh, um, band that you oh, can get. Know. Yeah, oh. and it's this crazy mix of <laughs> militaristic Egyptian music he and was free so jazz. And it, it's wow. like all his language of describing it is all wow. from Sun Ra. Yeah. What, what's the name of the album? I know. That's like the problem of ending something is I kind of want to go to Egypt right now. But I <laughs> to like to check this out. But, yeah, I mean, um, we didn't even talk about all that yeah. in relationship. Like, you know, yeah. this idea of the apocalypse. Have Dan make a, a, a map of that. A map of Sun Ra. Coming up with some ideas. I know he's over Sun Ra. It doesn't sound like it. <laughs> Do it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Dan, you want to talk about what you're working on? Oh gosh. Um, I would say I'm I'm continuing on the um, uh, the paintings that I, I call quests. Some of the works that are in the show in, in various forms is one thing. But um, I've been did a lot of reflecting this year on artists that were important to me in my in my formative years, and have um, started um, kind of the, a, a dangerous project, which is to uh, think really deeply about a, an artist and a work that still resonates with me, and 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 make a work that is essentially a dialogue with that work, and is very self consciously. Um, Similar to it, embracing it, uh, playing off of it, but you know, thinking about what that artist was thinking about, and maybe what I don't agree with as well, or what agree with what was written about it, or the way it was often interpreted. But it's a little bit. Um, um, I mean, it's it, these two bodies of works are are very similar in many ways, and uh, I kind of have a history of going off in other tangents sometimes, and kind of uh, embrace the the right, you know, to do that, I guess. Uh, mm. But these um, um, these are really challenging for me because, in a way, at, at, at uh, you know, I long ago stopped, stopped, you know, thought, thought long ago in my work that it developed to the point where you know you have to uh, get past your influences, uh, you know, post art school, whatever, and you know, really find your own voice. And I feel like I've done that for a long time. To so then to think to do this and to really kind of um, push it is a little bit like, is this, is this really a good idea, you know? But uh, it's my idea, I can do whatever I want. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm actually I'm making, a, working on a piece related to, um, um, in dialogue with uh, a Marcel Broder's piece that I 
really, I love the story. Yeah, yeah. So I, I actually I alluded to it, but I didn't really explain Betty Sue. Is uh, I, I had a crate I was going to send the works in, and I've I've sort of been rethinking and recreating his crate piece where he had a show that you didn't get to see the art because it was in yeah, yeah, and um, and I so I the crate was no longer available, so mm -hmm. I had to find another crate. So. But anyway, but there's you know other layers to it and all that. So that's sort of my obsession du jour. How about you? Well, I I recently uh, I mentioned that I started working with Super 8 film, and I recently started working with uh, a Super 16 millimeter film. Mm -hmm. So I'm right now I'm working on um, <coughs> Super 16 millimeter film, which is shot in different places, <coughs> different cities, different countries, but it's. Um, it's kind of a collage which has a narrative about a group of people who keep trying to accomplish something, keep failing, but are still hopeful. And it's it, the narrative is kind of poetic, and the way I use the images um, is to try not to um, have the image and the narrative uh, relate literally, but somehow using gestures and, and uh, I don't know, affiliations. And, uh, and I'm also trying to do similar effects um, on the 16 millimeter film uh, using chemicals, which then they become completely different because every frame has, uh, you know, this effect. So it's like an animation, an abstract animation on top of the images, uh, on top of the film. Um, yeah, so it's it's a, a big project, but hopefully I will finish it by spring next year. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Too, I have a big project, but I hopefully will finish my. Well, you should tell year. us about it. You're yeah. the only one who can talk about your work. Well, I'm working on a couple of things, and uh, one is a. Um, the shorthand is to call it a lesbian time travel video. But uh, I've, I've <laughs> the last couple of years, I did work in a all women's, predominantly lesbian RV retirement community on the Southwest Desert, and these were like. In high season, 500 women are there. So, um, so some of it's going to be shot there. But uh, uh, again, I'm looking at this idea of collapsing generations, mm -hmm. collapsing uh, the idea of time, collapsing the the word lesbian, but <laughs> and which I use because in terms of the the ele now 11 letter acronym LGBTF, yeah. I well, uh, <laughs> lesbians. <laughs> least uttered in that chain. Right. <laughs> so, it's not so, fashionable anymore. No, maybe. so part of what I'm looking at is like in the 70s, a decoupling of lesbian from feminism is a term. But, um, mm -hmm. but recent archive work I did was I looked at the two uh, letters between two science fiction writers, uh, James Tiptree Jr. and Joanna Ross. And Joanna Ross oh, wrote The Female Man, Where which was letters? in Oregon. We'll talk about this. Oh, yeah. And then Tiptree. Uh, wrote as uh, a man, it was her, it was really Alice Sheldon, but she wrote as a man for 12 years oh before anybody God. knew she was a, a woman. <laughs> and she had a lengthy correspondence with both Ursula Le Guin and uh, Joanna Russ, who was a, a very out feminist and lesbian in science fiction at the time, which was unusual. <coughs> so uh, Russ thought she was writing a man, and the letters are phenomenal. There's a 20 oh years age goodness. difference between them. So <coughs> it's this is going to be the driving narrative in the video. I'm that is I'm bold. Do and then the, I know I'm really excited, but I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. And so, <laughs> <laughs> and then the other piece I want to work with, um, uh, Octavia Butler's papers have just come online, or they're now public mm -hmm. at the <coughs> Huntington Library. And um, so I hope to work with those and the Huntington. Maybe some of the curators there will let me work in the garden. So. A, a project based on the deritis of her papers, not the manuscripts themselves, but she kept extensive notes. And if you don't know who any of these people are, these women, these sci-fi writers, read them. You're so lucky. Yeah, oh my god, they're amazing, but if you don't know them. Anyway. That's the end of our panel. It's exactly <laughs> 3 o'clock. Thank you. Sorry, we didn't give you more. Thank you. Thank you for your time.